Hey, welcome. We're so glad that you are joining us again this week for Connection Church. And hey, if it's your first time, we're maybe even more excited. Are we? Yeah, we're more excited that you're uh, that you're here for the first time because we kind of are a little biased. We love what we're up to here at Connection, and we're so excited that you are here with us, just participating in this way. Um, man, hopefully you've had a good week up to this point, and uh, hopefully you're prepped for uh, just a good time together in this way as we kind of take in a message, and then hopefully you're part of a group that you can jump in on and, and discuss and talk about, hey, how do I apply the truths that we're talking about to my life here and now? We're so excited to have the home group leaders that we have. Man, they're just, they're awesome. We applaud all of you and thank you for your time and your effort. Hey, we are wrapping up a series called Hello, My Name Is. And for the last number of weeks, we've taken a dive into a few major individuals of the Christian faith. Not because we necessarily don't know them, but because we likely don't know them as well as we could. God, the Father, or Yahweh, uh, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, uh, last week was a Jesus follower, and now today, your neighbor. A major aspect to the Jesus following faith is that we are to love our neighbors. Jesus himself tells us this as one of the two things he reduces all the laws of the old law down to. He says, love God and love your neighbor. And it's really funny because in one of the Gospels, the moment he says this, someone spoke up and asks a question we here 2,000 years later would be wondering. So just who exactly qualifies as my neighbor? Was, was this guy asking for clarification so he wouldn't miss anyone? Or was he asking to know who he wouldn't have to include? And depending on who you are, you'll probably resonate with one of those two things. If you've got just a big heart and you just love loving everyone, you'd be like, wow, I just, I want to make sure I don't miss anyone. And then maybe if you're like more of the population, a few people pop to mind and you're thinking, oh no, I hope it doesn't include them. You see, the Gospel of Matthew records it as the leader in the religious law trying to trap Jesus. Mark records it as the leader in religious law honestly leaning in to Jesus' words. It says Jesus was impressed with his understanding. And then Luke, where we're going to dive into, Luke records it as Jesus putting the question back on the leader in religious law to kind of ask him the question, what do you think? So let's take a deeper look into it ourselves. So this is Luke 10, and this is starting in verse 25 and going to 37. Uh, you can be hopefully following along in your Bibles, in your YouVersion app, but again, it'll be up on the screen. This is the New Living Translation. It says this, One day an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him, this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, putting it back to him, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him. Do this and you will live. <laughs> now here's where we really resonate with the story. It says, the man wanted to justify his actions. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead at the side of the road. By chance, a priest came along. But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant walked over, looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. Then 
a despised Samaritan came along. The relationship between Jews and the Samaritans was not good at all. It says when he came along and he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, like two days of wages, telling him, take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now, which of these would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. Man, what a story. We'll unpack it in just a sec, but I want to pray before we go any further. God, thanks so much for our time together today. I'm so thankful that we can, we can uh, continue to connect despite the restrictions. God, we've been able to lean in in a way that, that keeps us connected, that keeps us uh, looking at your word and encouraging each other. And I pray that no matter the week that we've come out of or the week that we believe is coming, that we would be present in this time. We'd be open to hear what you want to speak to us out of your word and just out of this message, God, that we would be encouraged, but we would be also challenged. Thanks for loving us and, and for your patience with us. In Jesus' name, amen. So, I'm your neighbor. Hi, it's nice to meet you. Or it's nice to see you again. Hey, my job isn't the greatest and, and my marriage, I mean, it's okay. It's, it's been better, but it's, it's been worse. I have great kids. I'm definitely not the greatest dad at times. I feel like I do a pretty good job of making it look like I have everything together, but I definitely don't. I think I struggle with depression at times, definitely some anxiety, and I'm not sure what to do with it. There are a lot of things I do for temporary escapes, but I'm worried I might lose myself in one or two of them if I'm not careful. Drinking, smoking pot here and there, porn, Netflix, overeating, submersing, submersing, submersing myself in work. I'm just not sure what life is all about. It's got to be about more than just me. Maybe these questions and stresses and doubts are things that you've wrestled with or still wrestle with, but I mean, I think you go to church and I, th I think it's one of those churches that believes in God and Jesus. So from the little I know, you're not tackling life by yourself. You've, I think you have God with you or something, even when you're not alone. I can't for the life of me think why we don't talk about that stuff. Maybe it's not all that big a deal to you. Maybe it's not as life-changing a thing as I was thinking it might be or hoped it would be. Yeah. Oh, well, I guess we'll stick to smiling, waving, being nice to each other and, and the small talk that never really amounts to much. Yikes. Is that the dialogue that potentially goes on in the minds of our neighbors? Are there, are there so many other things below the surface that we just don't know? I mean, as most of us, right? That's pretty much all of us, I guess, that there's more going on beneath the surface of what we let others know or let the majority of people no, and I can't help but think when we're talking about neighbors, what's going through people's minds? I'm not saying that it's in the head of all the people we would classify as our neighbors, like the kind of dialogue that I just went through, but it's definitely in some. How tragic is that? How tragic is that if if our neighbors, if the people that we rub shoulders with, anyone, has 
even a hint of an idea that those of us who are Jesus followers, if, if they think, hey, hey I, I think there's something different about them in a good way, um, I think they go to church or they would ascribe to that belief system and they think things like, I wonder why they don't bring it up. Or maybe it's, maybe it's just an add-on to their life. I mean, it's kind of tragic to think about. But to look further at, at our neighbors and to boil things right down, our neighbors are either Jesus followers themselves or they're not. If they're Jesus followers, our role in loving them, as we looked at a, a minute ago, that Jesus says we're to love our neighbors. Our role in loving other Jesus followers, is, and we see this in Scripture, is to build up and encourage them in the faith. If our neighbors are not, and again, this is more than just the people who live on either side of you, but if our neighbors are not, Scripture tells us that they will know we are Christians. They'll know that we're Jesus followers by our love. Now, that's such an interesting and heavy statement. They'll know we're Christians by our love. So they should know or see something is different about you or, and me in a good way. Something that we don't necessarily have to have spoken about. I mean, it may come across in, in our encouragement, in our, uh, how we speak of our perspective in life. They will know we're Christians by our love. Do we, do we have a reason to share the hope and the faith that we have? That's another question. As we look at, hey, why... Why haven't we had conversations with our neighbors? Why haven't we been maybe living this, this Jesus-following faith out, if that's what you would classify yourself as? Do we have reason to share the hope and faith that we have? Is there enough joy and gratitude within you for what Jesus has done for you that you want to share it with others? Do you, do you believe it makes a difference in your life that other people should want? Kind of like the statement, why would anyone not want what I have? Has, has what Jesus has done for you, has it been enough to compel you to live differently? Or is it something that, that you just keep to yourself. Because I think for all of us, we do. We keep it to ourselves for different reasons at different times. There's many things that can stand, unfortunately, in the way. There's a massive danger for Jesus followers. And it's something that the enemy is so slick at getting us to fall into. Keeping what we believe to ourselves. And we can come up with quite the list as to why we do this. And again, different reasons in different seasons. One of the first things that I know happens for me is pace, the pace of life. A moment comes up where I think, hey, this might be an opportunity for me to say something. But then I look at my watch and I know there's other things for me to be getting to. And the pace of life is at a speed that it's not, it's not able to be interrupted or, or I lead myself to believe that. How's the pace of your life when it comes to allowing for interruptions such as we're talking about? How's the pace of your life? Maybe another thing that stands in the way is, is a fear of what to say. Maybe you just think, Shoot, I think my neighbor's great. I love my faith. I think it's changed my life. But I have no idea what to say. Listen, we were just talking about this. We were just talking about this two weeks ago when we looked at the role 
of the Holy Spirit in the life of a Jesus follower. One of the roles is to to guide us in truth and to help give us the words to say in a situation. But practically, can I just tell you that personal experience, a personal story of how Jesus has interrupted and, and positively changed your life, you almost can't go wrong with that. I think we worry sometimes when we think of having to intellectually convince somebody about the faith that we may hold to. But that's, that's not what we need to be doing. We don't want people to logically come to this idea or this belief of, well, yeah, I mean, I guess it makes sense, so I'll lean into it. Right? We, we want to tell people about how Jesus has, has changed our life. How Jesus has given us hope and purpose. And he's brought us peace in the midst of situations where peace should have arguably been the last thing, logically, that we would be experiencing. Maybe another thing that that stands in the way of us sharing faith or loving our neighbors in such a way that we should is, is fear of what they'll think. What will they think if you say something? about your faith? What's what's their background? Maybe they've had bad experiences. I don't think that's for us to worry about because really what's on the table, what we're putting on the scales is what will they think if you say something and what does Jesus think if we don't? I mean, that question kind of hangs in the balance. But I want to pose one more thing that I think I think is really practical for us at Connection Church. And it's going to take us looking back into the scripture that we read. Again, out of Luke. So the situation, Jesus is being, has been posed with a question of who is my neighbor? And he tells this story that there would have been familiar aspects all through this story to those who are listening, things that are unfamiliar to us here and now. Some things we can resonate with. The priest arguably should have been the guy who kind of saves the day. The temple assistant, kind of number two in who should be saving the day. It's described that this stretch of road was referred to as the way of blood. (laughs) Real nice place for a midnight stroll, huh? It was so known to be a place for robbers and thieves and bandits. It was a scary place to be. And there's, there are sections of this road that are so narrow, large sections of the road that are so narrow that the idea of of the priest and the Levite crossing to the other side would have been more like stepping over the injured man. Which kind of brings a little bit of insult to the whole thing. I mean, not that walking to the other side of the road is a whole lot better, but literally having having to step over someone you're, you're having to exert that much more energy to avoid doing something. What do you think the biggest reason was that the first two guys avoided helping the injured man? Like, why? why? Is, there, is there the fear that maybe there were other bandits around and if they stopped to help, maybe they were fearing for their own life? But arguably, the life of a priest is all about putting others before him. So that one kind of shouldn't make sense, even though you can still worry about your own life. I mean, maybe he was worried about, I don't know, getting all messy, helping the guy. I have to believe, I have to believe that one of the biggest things standing in the way is the fact that no one was around. 
No one was around. If there were other people standing on the road, also maybe not doing anything, but looking at the injured man, a priest, a temple assistant, would likely be worried about what other people would think if they just passed them by. So the fact that no one was around, no witnesses, to see that they just avoided the man. He would probably be passing on sometime that night anyway. So why bother helping? No one's around to see that I'm walking by. And I think here's the tie-in for us. Is it part of our culture? Is it part of our faith journey, especially being part of connection, to be asking, hey, how are you doing at loving your neighbors? Because if we don't ask the question, if we don't talk to each other about how our faith journey is going, how how sharing our faith is going, it's kind of like no one's around. It's a critical way for us to propel forward our vision of helping helping build faith and community one life at a time. And it's how we practically push our mission of building meaningful connections with people, encouraging them in their connection or pursuit of Jesus, and how we'll start to develop a felt connection with the community. Not to mention that it it moves forward what Jesus is calling us to. Knowing that we're going to be asking intentional questions of each other brings accountability. It helps underscore the importance of what we're called to and what we're saying is central to us here at Connection. Hello, my name is your neighbor. I think our neighbor, our neighbor's a lot of people. Our neighbors are a lot of people that we're okay reaching out to. Our neighbors are also people that we absolutely don't want to reach out to. The Samaritan in the story, again, was someone who was despised by Jews. It wasn't the other way around. It wasn't that a a, a Jew who looks down on Samaritans was the one who stooped to help the Samaritan. The Samaritan was the person who'd been wronged. And man, if that's not the kind of people that we are least likely to reach out to, people who've wronged us, people, people who haven't leaned in for us, Jesus is painting a massive picture here of who our neighbors are. And these are the people we're supposed to show love to. They're the people who who need to to see that, that the Jesus element in our life changes us to be more than who we would be on our own. I want to draw your attention to one more thing before we wrap up. And it's the story of Esther. And I just want to give you a little bit of kind of a recap of what's gone on in the story up to the point of this one phrase that I want to look at. Because I think this phrase, I think this verse of scripture, I think it really calls out to us as well. So in the story, Esther finds herself being able to have influence with the king. Her people group, there's threat of wiping them all out. And her uncle says to her, you have an opportunity. You have an opportunity with the king. And he says this in chapter 4. Verse 14, the second part of verse 14, he says, And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. I can't help, I can't help but think, 
if that statement goes out to us for where we live, for where we work, for any teams or clubs that we're a part of, even for the moments that we may find ourselves in the grocery store, and we feel a nudge from the Holy Spirit, potentially, potentially putting the phrase before us, hey, maybe you have come to be in this place for such a time as this, to bring hope, to show love, to extend grace, purpose, to share the faith that you have that's changed your life as a Jesus follower with someone who needs to hear that. Whether that's individually, as Connection Church as a whole, as we continue to unfold our vision and mission, as we continue to pursue the kind of life that Jesus is calling us to. We're excited. We're excited to see restrictions lift and to be able to see our community outreach take shape, loving our neighbors. As Jesus followers, the greatest thing we can do is share the hope that we have with someone who has yet to experience it. Our world needs the answer we have. So what are we going to do with it? And will you help cultivate the culture of helping build faith and community one life at a time? Before we close in prayer, I just want to tell you, I want to tell you about our neighbors. On one side of us lives a guy named Dennis. Man, he's a great guy. Pretty near everything he has, he'd share with somebody. He'd give to somebody. He'd lend to somebody. He smokes meat. He barbecues almost all the time. And so his place smells great. And again, he's more than willing to share anything and everything he has. He doesn't know Jesus. He hasn't experienced the hope and purpose that Jesus can bring. On the other side of us, Gary and Rose, also equally generous. Just awesome, gentle people who also don't know Jesus. They don't know the hope and the purpose, the peace that Jesus brings. These people are our neighbors, but so are the people that we bump into at the grocery store. So are the people that we've come to know in various circles of life. And so are the people who've wronged us, who've hurt us, who've done things that we wouldn't wish on any other, any other person. These people are all our neighbors. Now, Dennis, and Gary, and Rose, they're people who are easy to love. But some of the others really takes the work of the Holy Spirit in us. And you can identify with those people maybe, having those people in your life and this call to love your enemies just as well as the people who, who are easy to love. It's gonna take the Holy Spirit working in us, continuing to change us to be more like Jesus. But won't those be the greatest stories to share? Let's pray. God, thanks for this time. Even though, even though aspects of this message, God, are so hard to swallow. It's easy. It's easy to love people who, who are nice, who are easy to love, who are generous, who love us back. Jesus, you modeled the fact 
that we need to love people who are difficult to love. That we need to reach out to all those who don't yet know you. Who need the hope and purpose that you offer. That our neighbors will know we're Christians by our love. May we be convinced beyond anything that what you've done for us is so worth sharing with someone else. And that our life, even before we speak about the faith that we have, our life would point to something different. Our life would point to one that's been changed by you. God, thank you. Thank you for what Jesus did on the cross for us. Thank you that all this is only possible because of his sacrifice. And that we can live in this way that we're talking about, loving those who are so hard to love. We can do that because we have the Holy Spirit within us. The power that raised Jesus from the dead is within Jesus' followers. God, I just pray for anyone right now who doesn't yet believe, who hasn't yet taken that step, and I pray that you would just, God, just remove all the barriers so that they would be able to experience what you offer. They would be done trying to to do everything themselves, to fill that hole within them with money, success, relationships, anything other than you. So I just pray that those people would say yes to you right now. Thank you. Thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for this message and for our chance to be a part of Connection Church that that we can look to make a difference in each other's lives and in the lives of those you've surrounded us with. May we do a great job loving our neighbors. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again for making the time uh, to watch this, to hopefully be jumping into a group uh, to discuss this. If you're not part of a group, man, get together with somebody. Ask the questions. Hey, how are you doing at, at loving on your neighbors, the people who are easy to love and the people who are tough to love? What do you do? I mean, start with food. (laughs) <laughs> right? Food, food's a good thing. Helps, helps bridge a lot of gaps. Hey, we're so thankful uh, for, for our home group leaders again who are leading the groups that I hope most of you are jumping into. Uh, thanks again for making this part of your time. We'd love for you to reach out to us if you're not yet connected with us. Find us on social media. Uh, send us a message. And hey, if you are someone who's just made uh, a decision to follow Jesus, we absolutely want to hear about it. So reach out to us with that as well. Have an awesome week and we'll see you soon.